Jason, welcome along to the podcast. Thanks, mate. Good to be here, as always. Earlier this month, uh, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese announced legislation that would ban children under the age of 16 from using social media. The proposed laws would hold tech companies responsible for enforcing this age limit, uh, and there would be penalties for non-compliance or failure to keep young users from these platforms. We're sort of thinking about this in the context of a broader global conversation, and you're wanting to contribute to that with your column for Maxim, titled Parents, Not Policies, Our Best Defense Against Social Media. Can you explain how legislation like the one proposed in Australia seeks to minimize smartphone-related harm among young people? Yes, I can. Uh, I think the consensus is coming to form that early and prolonged exposure to social media or just digital devices in general has a negative effect on young people, on their development, on their mental health. Um, the Surgeon General in the US earlier this year warned that, well, he, he, he wrote an op-ed where he said, I wish that uh, I could put um, harm warnings on social media like they do on cigarettes, you know, like using this product will cause you harm. Um, and I think it's true. I mean, if you've ever watched any of these documentaries from the guys who used to work at Google, um, Tristan Harris and these people who say that there's teams of psychologists at um, these social media companies who are helping to design uh, these platforms in a way that they um, appeal to your basest reptilian kind of brain. Uh, I think he classified it as a race to the, bre- to the bottom of the brainstem. So whatever will keep you on there. Um, he also said, whenever you're not paying for a product, you are the product. And I think that's, uh, really opening that they give all these stuff, um, these platforms away for free. You can access them, whatever. And yet they're billion dollar companies. So there is a consensus around this globally from people who are industry insiders, people who are, um, psychologists, uh, health professionals who have, um, kind of weighed in and studied this and they go, there is something wrong with this. How can we fix it? And so they kind of fall into these two camps. One is we just ban it. We say, no, nah, can't have it um, for under, under 16 in, in the case of Australia. Uh, others just say, no, we just have to live with it. And um, we just kind of have to, you know, put programs and education in place to help our kids because they're going to encounter this anyway. And we just need to make sure that they, um, are able to navigate the digital world safely. And and I think those are two opposite approaches that miss some of the texture from, mm. from the conversation. And so I think my, um, my column was a, a, an attempt to kind of cut a third way through this rather than saying um, it, it's all on the government and they have to legislate and they just need to you know, bring the, 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 the power of the state to bear on this. Um, I think it's similar in some ways to the, the media, uh, the media negotiation, mm. um, thing where they want tech companies to pay for the media that they use. We think the government will fix this problem. So let's just get the government to legislate. Um, but, but that hasn't gone well overseas for that particular industry either. Um, and then there's the, the, well, we'll just let kids kind of, figure it out on their own. We'll give them some guidance, but um, we're not really going to do too much in that or we'll let the schools do it, you know, as part of the, you know, we'll put another thing on the schools so they can educate our kids as digital citizens. And I think there's this way where we've kind of ignored the power that parents have to uh, to shape, inform, and to really set boundaries and enforce those boundaries for their kids far more easily and readily yeah. than a government or a school or a teacher can. What's interesting about the Australian situation is that this ban, this proposal has received bipartisan support. Uh, So given that clearly you have more wisdom and knowledge than the entirety of the Australian (laughs) parliament, can you just outline for us what your proposed solution is? Yeah, well, I I don't know if we, if I have more wisdom than the entire parliament. Um, There was a a list of recommendations from their report that um, ultimately recommended that the ban didn't go forward. Um, so there's a few, uh, at least points of agreement there. My solution would be to empower parents basically, because I think my uh, kind of the way that I imagine this was like, if you have, uh, a 
um, a, a policymaker in Wellington or even a, a digital oligarch in Silicon Valley, and they are trying to control your child's behavior, um, it's far more difficult for them than you as a parent or me, me as a parent going, uh, I'm just going to take that, take that cell phone out of your hand or I'm just going to switch the internet off or I'm just going to you know send you outside to play or whatever it is. It's far more easy um, for parents to parent and to to do that than it is for um, than a law or a, or a tech company to, to legislate that sort of thing and to police it. And so I think the solution is really to empower parents. Um, like one of the things that that I just thought about off the top of my head was that when your kid gets a device for the first time at school, you are taught how to monitor, you know, it comes with like a webinar and you, or when you pick up the device, um, you have to go to the school and, uh, and go through a, a seminar on this is how you monitor this device. This is how you set uh, internet filters. This is how you, or, or it could even come with like, it would be great if, if maybe instead of, um, banning things, the the government paid for a subscription to one of the like services like Net Net Nanny right. that um, helps parents monitor their kids and they they get notifications when their kids are going off on websites they shouldn't or helps to filter out these websites and things like that. So I think giving parents tools and knowledge to do that when their kids first enter this world of digital. I mean, a lot of a lot of schools have. Um, um, filters and things that filter out websites or monitoring so that the, the teachers can monitor what the kids are doing, but then extend that to home and, and equip the parents because the parents are right there all the time, one-on-one -on -one every day. So, so yeah. I guess what, what I hear you saying then is that parents, because they're on the front line, they are most uh, effective to do what's right for their children. They can actually physically intervene. There's no VPN to get around direct parental supervision. But the trick is figuring out, well, how can we uh, educate parents to make them aware of the risks and also give them the tools uh, to help support their children and to protect them from some of the harm that they may face online. I guess the question I have is, if we suspend some of the technical difficulties of, en of enforcing or implementing a social media ban, if you could just snap your fingers and say, look, social media, no more for those under the age of 16, would you do it and, and why? Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're taking out the fact that, you know, parents, uh, kids can borrow devices or they can get around VPN, they can use a VPN or they can sneak, I think that's... I think that's not possible. Uh, if I could turn off the internet for under sixteen-year-olds, then yeah, that that'd be great. I would do that. But it, but if I if I just make the law, um, that I think that would bring a lot more difficulties. I think, uh, for example, how would you verify properly that a, that a child is sixteen? Would you use their birth certificate? Would you um, use a student ID? I mean some of those documents can be faked. I mean, that's that's the thing, right? A kid with, a, with a access to a Photoshop can make a birth certificate say whatever they want it to say. It's hard to do that. And do you really want to have to get them to go and get it signed by a JP as a verified copy before they send it in? You know, that sort of thing. Um, we're, then we're exposing their information to uh, digital um, incursion and things like that. So... There's just, there's a lot of technical things that we have to take with, the world as it. it is, not as we would yeah. like it. So yeah. <laughs> we've outlined then some of the things that parents can do, but is there anything yeah. the government can do? Because the government is certainly more well-resourced than the average parents. I think that resourcing parents, like the idea of giving webinars or um, education to parents, uh, is is something that they could they could do. I mean, again, there's the whole digital divide thing as well, where some kids don't even have access to devices, um, but they still have access to social media in mm. some way. So yeah, it's interesting. I'm not sure there's a blanket thing the government could do. I think it would have to be a whole bunch of things um, to to be really effective. So I think edu but I think education is the important thing for parents, education for parents um, and backing parents. I think there's this mm. kind of, 
Well, and maybe help it because I think a couple of things. <laughs> I think there's kind of this idea that parents are helpless and can't parent their own kids and don't know what's best for their kids. So the government can take it off, can take that load off them and make sure that the government will parent their kids, which is a bit scary when you think about an institution parenting your children. And then there's also the fact that some parents don't have the best digital habits themselves. And so um, monitoring those habits or or self, you know, changing your self behavior around that to, to model for your kids, I think is important as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that there's one thing the government could do other than I think the, the thing that would have the biggest impact was to, it would be to really resource parents and help them to um, engage well themselves with social mm. media and to engage with um, their children well with social media. I mean, I'm I'm quite a big fan of having the, the computer in the living room <laughs> where everyone kind of hangs out. So I don't like the fact that these days, most kids will take their phone or their laptop, go to their room, lock the door, and the parents have no idea what they're doing. I think if you say, oh, if you're going to be on your device, you've got to sit here in the family room or around the dining table or whatever, and everyone can see and we can all hear, no headphones on, you know, unless you're watching something that's really going to interrupt everyone. Um, because then there's there's just that automatic atmosphere of accountability. You're like, oh, someone could just look over my shoulder. Um, what am I going to do? So rather than shutting ourselves off. Um, I think there's scope for um, publicly um, mm-hmm. it, that kind of communal interaction with these devices as well. All right. Final challenge to you then. Yeah, uh, two, no. This will come in the form of two questions. One, are you a okay. libertarian? In no. A complete sense. no. Okay. No. So if the US Surgeon General says that social media is harmful to children, the implication then, you not being a full libertarian, is that the government should step in to some degree and do something. Is there anything that they can do to put pressure on the social media companies to ensure their product is at least less harmful for children than it could be? Off the top of my head. Yeah. Time I think, limit? I think, like I'm, I think, I guess I went really detailed on what you're talking about, like time limits or age verification or or things like that. But I think that, um, just transparency from the tech companies or even helping uh, requiring that if someone's under the age of some of a certain age that they have to have a parent account associated with theirs and that parent account has parental controls or something like that um, that are really easy to use. Uh, like something similar to YouTube Kids maybe, you know, um, which still isn't, hundred percent safe for kids either. So, um, but, but something like that, I think that sort of, um, legislation or pressure even, um, yeah. would be helpful. Yeah. And I think a, a solution like that actually is quite perceptive of, because what you are doing is you're actually making parents job easier uh, yeah. to help them look after their kids and, and to protect them. So it's not that we do nothing, it's not the government should do nothing, but the government should realise its limitations and should equip those, namely parents or caregivers, who can actually help their kids the most. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Awesome. Thanks for your thoughts, Jason. Really appreciate what you had to bring to the conversation. Oh, good to be here, mate. Thanks. Australia's recent ban on social media for under 16s has reignited a long-standing debate. The US Surgeon General has warned that social media presents a profound risk of harm to young people, and with good reason. These platforms' algorithms are precision engineered to capture developing minds serving up an endless stream of potentially harmful content, from self-harm videos to sexually aggressive material, often within hours of joining. Yet the discussion has become a dichotomy. Some advocate for outright bans, eager to use government power decisively. Others feel that we need to accept social media as an unavoidable part of our children's lives. Both approaches miss the mark. While raising minimum age requirements might seem appealing as a quick fix, it creates a dangerous illusion of safety based on a dependency on government intervention. The real solution isn't another law or resigned acceptance, It's recognizing parents as the primary decision makers in their children's digital lives. We don't need politicians in Wellington or digital oligarchs in Silicon Valley deciding what's best for our kids. 
No government policy can match the effectiveness of an engaged parent, whether they say no to a smartphone request or use monitoring apps to help their child navigate the digital world. Indeed, experts and organizations like NetSafe have pointed out that bans are practically unenforceable. Children can still access content through peers. Worse, such measures can alienate teens from open conversations with parents, pushing their online activities underground. What works is a balanced approach. Parents set clear boundaries, discuss digital etiquette, and model healthy social media habits themselves. Yes, mum and dad, I did say model healthy social media habits. I'm looking at you. Put down the phone now and go find the kids. Okay, I'm sort of kidding. The current push for age restrictions could even be counterproductive. Such measures create a forbidden fruit effect and undermine parents' ability to teach responsible technology use. Waiting for government intervention or settling for harm reduction isn't the answer. What's more effective, a government ban that tech-savvy teens can easily bypass with borrowed devices, or a parent who understands the risks and chooses not to provide their child with a smartphone in the first place? This kind of empowerment requires three things. Robust, user-friendly parental controls that actually work. Education for parents about digital platforms and their effects on child development. And transparency from tech companies about their user data. More importantly, let's stop treating parents as helpless bystanders in the digital age. While they may not have grown up with TikTok or Instagram, They understand their children's needs, personalities, and maturity levels far better than any legislator or tech executive can. We must recognize that parents, armed with knowledge, conviction, and a few tools like Custodio, NetNanny, or Norton Family, remain our most effective line of defense against digital threats. Rather than reaching for bureaucratic band-aids, let's give mum and dad back their power.